المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all, I'd like to say Happy New Year to all of you Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make this year a year of uh, light and blessings um, as well as a year of recovery and success May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you patience and uh, relief uh, if you are afflicted uh, Ameen So, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by quoting a hadith This is in Kitab al-Siyam in the Sunan of Ibn Majah Imam Ibn Majah which is one of the sound six books of hadith uh, in, in uh, a Sunni tradition The hadith says عن ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال قدم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة فوجد اليهود سياما فقال ما هذا So the hadith begins by saying that on the authority of Ibn Abbas may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Ibn Abbas and Al-Abbas that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he entered Medina and he found the Jews were fasting so he said, what is this? And this was on the 10th of Muharram, okay, as other traditions uh, indicate. Now, now, the Arabs before Islam, uh, including the Prophet Sallallahu probably, uh, used to fast on this uh, day as well. Uh, that was because this day was associated with the sacred history of the Ishmaelites, the Bani Ismail, okay, the Arabs. But now in Medina, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he noticed that the Israelites were also fasting on the 10th of Muharram. Uh, so the hadith continues, قَالُوا هَذَا يَوْمٌ أَنْجَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ مُوسَى وَأَخْرَقَ فِيهِ فِرْعَوْنَ So they said to him, meaning the Yahud said to him, this is the day upon which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala saved Musa Alayhi Salam and drowned the Pharaoh. فَصَامَهُ مُوسَى شُكْرًا so Musa alayhi salam, he fasted on this day out of gratitude, out of shukr. So in Judaism, this day is called Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Okay, it's, it's on the 10th of Tishrei, the month. It's called, in Hebrew, it's called the Asara bi Tishrei. Okay, in Hebrew, it's called Asura. Sorry, in Aramaic, it's called Asura, the language of Isa alayhi salam. That's in Arabic, it's called the Ashura. Okay. The hadith concludes, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِمُوسَى مِنْكُمْ فَصَامَهُ وَأَمَرَ بِسُيَامِهِ And that's the end of the hadith that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said, we have more right to Musa عليه السلام than you do. And then he fasted on this day or continued to fast on this day uh, and then ordered the Sahaba also to fast. So in the Hanafi school, it is a, an emphasized sunnah, sunnah mu'akkada, to fast on Yomi Ashura, as well as either a day before or after, okay, the 9th or the 11th, and this is to distinguish our, ourselves from the Bani Israel. It's actually makru tanzihan, it's like slightly disliked to just fast Yomi Ashura. So I believe this coming Wednesday, is it Wednesday or Thursday, will be the 10th of Muharram. I should have looked at the calendar. I think it's Wednesday, inshallah. Um, so, so this day of Ashura carries uh, tremendous sanctity, hurma, for both Muslims and Ahlid Kitab. Now, the, the statement of the Prophet sallallahu we have more right to Musa than you do, is very interesting. So Musa alayhi salam was an Israelite prophet. And what I mean by that is, he's, he's a, he was a descendant of Ya'qub alayhi salam. Okay, so Yaqub was surnamed Israel, okay? And Yaqub alayhi salam, he had 12 sons who were the progenitors of 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, one of the sons of Yaqub was named Levi, okay? These are the priests, they're called the Kohanim. Okay, so Musa alayhi salam is from that line. But he was Muslim in faith. Musa alayhi salam submitted his entire being to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aslama wajhahu lillah. Okay, so he, he, he certainly was not a Jew. Okay, so the word Jew as a, as, a, uh, as a member of a religion called Judaism did not exist at that time. Okay, this is called an anachronism. That would be like saying George Washington was a Mormon, right? Do you understand why that's a problem? 
George Washington was, uh, he lived in the 18th century, but Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, lived in the 19th century. Okay, so the word Jew at the time of Musa, salam, Yehuda, meant a descendant of Judah, one of the other sons of Yaqub. So it was a tribal distinction. It was not the name of a religion. So Musa, alayhi salam, is not even a Jew according to this definition uh, as a tribal distinction. Okay, so Bani Israel was the Muslim Ummah uh, at that time. And of course, according to our tradition, Musa alayhi salam spoke of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam uh, in Surah Al-Ahqaf, verse number 10. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ara'aytum in kana min indillah wa kafartum bihi wa shahida shahidum min bani Israel ala mithlihi fa'amana wa staqbartum inna Allah la yahdi al-qawma al-dhalimim uh, don't you see that this is from Allah and he rejected while a witness from the children of Israel? And Imam Al-Qurtubi says, Musa alayhi salam bore witness to one like him and has believed while you are arrogant. And Allah does not guide an unjust uh, people. Okay. Um, and of course, Waraqa bin Nawfal, when he heard about the initial wahi upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he said, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ لَقَدْ جَاءَكَ أَنَّ مُوسُ الْأَكْبَرْ كَمَا جَاءَ إِلَى مُوسَى The great law of God or spirit of God has come to you just as it came to Musa alayhi salam. Okay. So the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he fasted on the day of Ashura to commemorate the Exodus, this amazing event in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested his jamal and jalal. Right, his beauty and majesty by saving the Israelites and destroying the Pharaoh and his hosts. This was one of the great days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he orders Musa alayhi salam, ذَكِّرْهُمْ بِآيَامِ اللَّهِ Remind them of the great days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam in the Quran, وَذَكِّرْ فِإِنَّ الذِّكْرَةً فَعُلْمُ مِنِي Remind them, for indeed reminders uh, benefit believers. So reminders of ni'am, reminders of blessings, engender theological virtues in the heart of the believers, like gratitude and patience and, and love and hope, etc. Now, Ashura and really the month of Muharram in general should be a time uh, when all Muslims remember the virtues of the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Ahli Bayti Rasulillah. Okay, love of the family of the Prophet sallallahu is a great uh, unifier of all Muslims. Okay, it was on it was on Yomi Ashura in 61 Hijri when the beloved grandson of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Imam Hussein ibn Ali, alayhi salam, he's also Hussein ibn Fatima, alayhi salam. Uh, it was on that day that he was martyred in Karbala in Iraq. Okay, it was said that Imam al Hussein, just prior to the battle, asked one of his companions, What is the name of, the, of this desert? Uh, and he was told, Karbala. And Imam al Hussein, he said, Naam, hadha karba wa bala. Right? Indeed, it is torment and trial. Very interesting. Karb in Arabic means a torment, a disaster. Bala means a, means a trial. In a hadith in Al Adab al Mufrad, a book of hadith called Al Adab al Mufrad. This is Imam Bukhari's other book, lesser known book. We're told that when Imam al Hussein was a small boy and he was playing in the streets, Yal Abu it says, uh, the Prophet saw him and extended his arms out and embraced him. And Hussein said something and it made the Prophet smile. Right? And then the Prophet says, the famous Hadiths, Husaynun minni wa ana minhu, or Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. Allahumma, uh, uh, then he said, Ahabba Allahu man ahabba al Hassan wal Husayn. Alqamma ta'ala alayhi salatu wa salam. So he said that, oh Allah, so he said, Husayn is from me and I am from him. Allah loves, uh, uh, Allah loves the one who loves Hassan and Husayn. Okay, and parents will really understand this. Nothing makes a father happier than seeing the happiness and joy of his children. So like Hussein was like the, they say, the apple of the prophet's eye, right? Just looking at Hussein 
put a smile on the Prophet's face and filled his heart with love. And this is reason enough to say that all Muslims should love Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And we say alayhi salam for Ahl al-Bayt. This is no problem. This is, this is something that's found in the books of Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah All of the great Sahaba loved Imam Hussein. Okay, even those who disagreed with him. Okay, when Imam al Hussein was in Mecca, right, so he fled to Medina, he made Hajj in Mecca, and invitations were pouring in from Kufa in Iraq. Okay, Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was in Mecca with great concern and respect for his cousin, Imam al Hussein, advised Imam al Hussein to not advance toward Kufa. So Ibn Abbas didn't think it was a good idea, okay? And he did that out of love for Imam al Hussein. Because Ibn Abbas knew it was very, very dangerous. He didn't want Imam al Hussein to be killed. It seems that Imam al Hussein knew that he was going to be killed uh, and his men were going to be massacred, okay? So, so rather than having his blood shed in Mecca and the sacred, sacred precincts in the Haram, he willingly started out into the desert. Okay, Imam al Hussein did not want blood to spill in the Haram because that would have set um, a precedent for the future political authorities. And eventually it did happen, right? When Yazid defeated Ibn Zubair in Mecca, and the Kaaba was actually damaged uh, during that, that uh, battle. That was in 683 of the Common Era, about three years after Imam al Hussein uh, left Mecca. Now, there's a difference, a difference of opinion as to actually who actually delivered the death blow to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The earlier sources say uh, it was a man named Sinan ibn Anas al Nahai. Okay, and later sources say it was a man named Shimr ibn Dil Joshan. Nonetheless, it's mentioned in Sunni sources that the severed head uh, of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was brought to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was the governor of Kufa. Some of the authorities say even to Damascus, to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Okay, and Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he's the one who killed Muslim bin Aqil in Kufa. He intimidated the Kufans, and he's the one who sent the army to Karbala. And uh, according to our sources, Ibn Ziyad, he would, he would have a stick or something, and he would strike the lips of Imam al Hussein, uh, taunting him, right? the severed head of Imam al Hussein. And Anas ibn Malik, who was, the, who was a great Sahabi, who was the servant of the Prophet وسلم, for over 10 years, he was present at one of these moments, and he said to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he said, Way haka, wallahi ra'itu Rasulullah yuqabbilu hadha al fam. He said, Woe unto you, indeed, I saw the Messenger of Allah, I swear to Allah, I saw the Messenger of Allah kissing that mouth that you're striking with this stick. So, you know, this was a, a massively tragic event in our history. And so the maqtal of Imam al Hussein, right, his, what's called the maqtal, his, you know, his martyrdom, his passion, his suffering, had a deep redemptive purpose. Okay, there was redemption in his suffering. So what did it do? It shook the sort of global consciousness of the Muslim Ummah from its sleep. So it caused like this world, this, I should say, Ummah-wide sort of sense of muhasaba and tawbah. You know, if this is happening to the grandson of the Prophet وسلم, to the family of the Prophet وسلم, if Muslim authorities are, are massacring people that are beloved to the Messenger of Allah, then we all need to check ourselves, right, and change our ways. Okay, that's usually what happens when we see someone that we know is better than us struggling. We should turn inwards and think, you know, what would happen to me? And this should engender a sense of toba, repentance, and tawadu, or humility. So the Muslim ummah was shaken. We must protect and honor the family of the Prophet Sallallahu so Imam al Hussein's actions provoked an incredibly powerful revival across the Muslim world. Okay, so all Muslims should love Imam al Hussein. If a Muslim doesn't love Imam al Hussein, then that Muslim has serious issues in his aqidah, in his foundational beliefs. Because how can a Muslim not love someone 
who was so incredibly beloved to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right? There's numerous hadith. There's a there's a hadith related by Imam Ahmad where he says, "Akhada bi yad al Hasanaini wa qal." That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took the hands of Hassan and Hussein and he said, "Man ahabbani wa wa ahabb hadaini wa ummahuma wa abahuma kana." Ma'i fi darajati yawm al-qiyamah Or kama qala alayhi salatu wa sallam So he said whoever loves me and these two And Hassanin, Hassan and Hussain And their father, Sayyidina Ali And their mother, Sayyidina Fatima Will be with me on the day of judgment Okay And it's the same question when it comes to someone like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq Or our mother Aisha How can a Muslim not love someone who was so incredibly beloved to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Right? Again, numerous hadith. Amr ibn al asi came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, ayu nas ahabu ilay. Who do you love the most? Qala Rasulullah Aisha, his wife. Uh, and then he said, min al rijal from the men, Abu Ha, her father. Thumma man, Umar. And then he said, fa'ad al rijal. Then he named a few other men. Right? He, in other words, I wasn't one of them. Right? So Aisha, and of course many like Shiite scholars will say that you know these hadith are fabricated and things like that. But facts don't lie. Okay, it is a fact that the Prophet is buried in the apartment of Aisha, then to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar ibn al-Khattab are buried next to him. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died while his head was resting on the chest of our mother Aisha, according to the sound hadith. And Sayyidina Ali prepared the body for burial. Okay. <laughs> Imam al-Haddad, who was a great scholar of the 18th century, Miladi, um, so he's considered the mujaddid of his time. He was in Karim, Yemen. Uh, he mentioned that Imam Ali ibn Hussein, so Zain al-Abidin, this is the son of Imam Imam Al Hussein. Uh, he said, "Inna Allah khaba thalatan fi thalat." That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has concealed three things in three things. He said, "The first thing is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala concealed His wrath, like His anger, ghadab, in acts of disobedience to Him." Okay, so the point is the point that he was making, Zain al Abidin, alayhi salam. Point that he was making is don't downplay any act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you don't know if the wrath of Allah is behind it. Right? Like somebody might say, I'll just tell a little white lie. But we don't know. Allah knows that little white lie could spiral and cause a lot of fitna for multiple people. Right? And then he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed his, his pleasure in acts of obedience to him. Is riba, or ridwan, right? So don't downplay any small act of goodness. There's a true story of a man. He he actually he took the bus to the Golden Gate Bridge and he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a true story, and he survived. And you know he did an interview after, and he said he said when I was sitting on the bus, if just one person would have looked at me with like a good expression or said, "Hey, how are you doing?" I would not have jumped. He said, you know. Just a minimal act of kindness. You know, a smile is sadaqah. The Prophet said, a smile is charity. Again, we don't know. Allah knows. A smile could save someone's life. And then he said, the third thing is that Allah, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concealed his wilaya fi khalqihi. Right? His sainthood or his friendship, his saints amongst the creation. The creation. He didn't say fi muslimin. Amongst the creation. Right? So some of the greatest Muslim scholars in the world were converts to Islam. They were atheists, agnostic, they were Christians. Right? Sayyidina Umar was resolved upon the most evil intention in the history of humanity. Right? He wanted to kill the Prophet. Imam al Qurtubi said that Sayyidina Umar was beloved to Allah when he was prostrating to idols in Mecca. The reason is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew the end of his life. He knew the end. Where is Umar now? He is buried next to the Messenger of Allah. He's in a garden from the gardens of paradise. So the point here is we should have good opinions of people in general, right? Muslim and non-Muslim. 
Now imagine when it comes to Sahaba and Ahlul Bayt, how much more careful should we be, right? As one of my teachers said, giving people the benefit of the doubt is at the very heart of spirituality, okay? I mean, we shouldn't be naive. Sometimes there's no doubt. But specifically, when we're dealing with people who are, who are in the orbit of the Prophet ﷺ, we must tread very, very lightly. Okay, also, we should never question another Muslim's love, right? So, like, if a Muslim uh, does not want to attend a gathering where the mawlid of the Prophet ﷺ is being celebrated, that's fine, he doesn't have to. That's not wajib. To attend a mawlid gathering is just ja'iz, it's permissible, right? That does not mean that this Muslim does not love the Prophet ﷺ. And to suggest that is to make takfir of that Muslim, right? It's very dangerous because... He's required to love the Prophet So that Muslim might manifest his love for the Prophet in other ways, ways that testify uh, to his love. Perhaps he fasts every Monday and Thursday. Perhaps he's uh, constantly memorizing hadith. Maybe he reads a page of sirah every night. In the same way, if Sunnis are not gathering in the masajid on the eve of, of Ashura, to commemorate the martyrdom, the maqtal of Imam al Hussein, that does not mean that Sunnis do not love Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with all their hearts. They simply express their love in other ways. So we have to be smart enough to reject uh, propaganda and divisive rhetoric when we hear it. I'll give you an example. I once heard a Shiite wa'id. A wa'id is a preacher, right? And, and preachers have incredible influence upon the masses. Because they appear to be scholars, right? And they're very charismatic. The lay people just assume that they're scholars because they look the part, right? Oh, he has a he has a beard. He quoted the Quran in Arabic. He must be a scholar. But there's a big difference between a wa'id and an alim, a proper scholar, right? First, it's really like age, right? So it, it takes a really long time to become a scholar, right? So anyone under forty, you know, just kind of take what they say with a with a grain of salt. You know, don't just accept things uncritically. Anyway, he said that Sunnis fast on Yomi Ashura because they want to forget about the death of Imam al Hussein. Right? So this is totally ridiculous. Fasting on Yomi Ashura predates his martyrdom. It is a sunnah of the grandfather of Imam al Hussein to fast on Yomi Ashura. Muslims long before the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein were fasting on Yomi Ashura, even as I said, in the pre-Islamic days, even before the Prophet Sallallahu it was associated with events in the lives of Ismail and Ibrahim and Nuh alayhi So, or you might hear a preacher say, the Sunnis opposed Hussein while the Shia defended him at Karbala. Right? The Sunnis opposed him, the Shia defended him. So this is historically inaccurate. And again, anachronistic. Again, it's, it's like saying something like the Navy SEALs fought in the Civil War. It doesn't make any sense. The word Sunni and Shi'i did not have theological distinctiveness at that time. And not only that, such a statement is very invective, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, it, in other words, it's intended to antagonize and create hatred, right? It's a very irresponsible thing to say. So the term Sunni and Sunni and Shia or Shi'i, as we know them, developed much later. Okay, or they'll claim that Abu Bakr and Omar hated Ali and vice versa. Right? Three of the sons of Sayyidina Ali, alayhi salam, that were uh, killed at Karbala, fighting next to Al Hussein, their brother, were called Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman. Okay, so if, if Sayyidina Ali hated Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and he hated Umar ibn al-Khattab, and he hated Uthman ibn Affan, if these were his you know, mortal enemies, why did he name three of his sons after his mortal enemies? So this is much more nuanced than we think, right? But people who love conflict and, and people who love fitna, they hate nuance. Okay, because they want the world to be black and white. It makes things easier. You don't have to think as much. Right? Uh, now, many Sunni preachers, Ra'ad, 
They also employ equally divisive language sometimes. I mean, I heard a khatib one time. He said, Yomi Ashura is important to us because of its connection to the Prophet ﷺ. And it doesn't matter if some random historical events happen to occur later on the 10th of Muharram. Right? So this is not how we speak about the Ahlul Bayt. This is bad adab. Right? And, and breaching adab with Ahlul Bayt is a very dangerous thing. My teachers in Yemen, they said, breaching adab with Ahlul Bayt puts one in danger of su al khatima of a bad ending. Right? Okay. So there's a hadith in Bukhari and Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma qala qala Abu Bakr as-Siddiq urqubu Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wasallam fi ahli baytihi. So this is from Ibn Umar, the son of Umar, that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said, be extremely vigilant, be exceedingly attentive about the Prophet with respect to his family. So that is from Abu Bakr. Now I remember once a, a Shiite gentleman asked me during a Q&A session, right? Because I, I not only do inter, what is it? Interfaith dialogue, but intra-faith dialogue, right? Also important. So he asked me, he said, he said, this is how exactly how he put it. Why do you go after the caliphs and not the 12 imams of Ahlul Bayt? This was his question to me. Why do you go after the caliphs and not the 12 imams of Ahlul Bayt? It's a very interesting phrasing of the question. Right? So I said, what, which caliphs are you talking about? And he said, the caliphs. I said, who are they? He said, Abu Bakr. I said, okay, who else? He said, Umar. I said, okay, keep going. Uthman. Keep it flowing. Ali. Oh, okay. You know. In Imam Sayyuti, he said there are five rightly guided caliphs, by the way. The Khulafa al Rashidin, Hassan ibn Ali was caliph for six months. So you see how this, the very question was faulty. Right? The very question sets up this false dichotomy. So this is a very nuanced issue. I mean, what if I said, do you respect the Ahlul Bayt or do you respect Aisha, the wife of the Prophet? You know, what a strange question. What a faulty question. Why is it faulty? Because in the Quran, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ are called Ahlul Bayt. In the Quran. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins a section in Surah Al Ahzab by saying, Ya Nisa an Nabi. That means, O oh, wives of the Prophet, nisa. You're not like other women. And it continues. And then in the next verse, we get the famous phrase. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants to remove from you every type of impurity, O people of the house, and render you pure and spotless. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after this, Right? And recite what has been, uh, or recite, you know, recite what has been, um, or remember what has been recited in your homes from the from the verses of Allah and wisdom. What kurna? This this verb, right? If you don't know Arabic grammar, then I can see how people can make mistakes. This this verb is a fi'l amr. It's second person feminine plural. This is only speaking to women. Okay, so addressing only the wives again. So the point is, the phrase Ahlul Bayt in the Quran occurs in the middle of a passage in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explicitly addressing the wives of the Prophet sallallahu But it's not limited to women. Because we go back, what does it say? إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ يُرِيدُ عَنْكُمْ رِجَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيْتَهِرُكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا That means that there are now men included. Women and men. Okay? But... That phrase is right in the middle of a passage. It's at the focus of a passage that is addressing the women of the Prophet ﷺ, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. All right. And not only this, the wives of the Prophet are called the mothers of the believers. Right? The Prophet is closer to the believers than, them, than their own self. And his wives are their mothers. Right? 
And the Prophet Sallallahu said, La tu'zini, la tu'zini fi Aisha. Don't hurt me regarding Aisha. Sound hadith. Okay. There's also hadith of Thaqalain, very famous hadith, the two weighty things. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, fikum I'm going to leave two weighty things. Kitabullah, the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Hablun Mamdudun Min Asma Il Al Ard. The book of God, the extended rope coming from the heavens to the earth, Wa Itrati Ahlu Bayti, and my close family members. Now there's another hadith that says, Kitabullah was Sunnah. Right? So again, a, a preacher or someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, uh, some amateur, might say, well, who are you going to follow? The Ahlul Bayt or the Sunnis? Right? <laughs> There's no contradiction here. Why? Because the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is preserved by the Ahlul Bayt, most of whom are Sunni. Right? So this is a fact. The vast is just a fact. The vast majority of the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu are Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They identify as Sunni. So I studied a little bit in Yemen, in Hadramaut. I wanted to study with Ahlul Bayt. Right? So the Ba'alawi Sadat in Yemen are, are Sunni. They're Shafi'i, Ash'ari. They adore Imam al-Ghazali. Um, they, they trace their lineage back to uh, a man named Ali al-Uraidi, who was one of the sons of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, right, who was the great-great-great-grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Both Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik ibn Anas, two great Imams, Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, they studied under Ja'far al-Sadiq. Now some of the Shia might say, that why don't Malikis and, and Hanafis become Ja'fari then in their fiqh? Right? The reason is not because Sunnis have something against Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. That's ridiculous. It's because the school of fiqh that would later be attributed to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq by the Shia was not preserved correctly according to the Sunni principles of preservation. Okay, so it's, it's a method problem. It's not a personal problem. Nothing personal. Right? Sunnis love all of the Imams, the family, the Prophet So the, the Sunni Shi'i, and I'm running out of time, I realize that. I'm actually out of time, but I'll, I'll just finish this point here, inshallah. The Sunni Shi'i divide has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? So the greatest scholars of Islam in the classical period, they couldn't figure it out. Modern scholars will probably not figure it out. Our preachers certainly will not figure it out. The propagandists are not going to figure it out. We simply have to accept that there is an insoluble difference of opinion and come together on broad universal principles. So like polemical debate, which is called jidan, Right? Among the awam, among laity, is haram, according to Imam Malik. It's haram for people that are not ulama to debate. Okay? And there's a reason why that is. There's an expression that says a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. Right? So what happens is lay people, they learn a few things, a few points, right? Here and there, a few arguments, maybe from watching some YouTube videos or something, and they think that they can now substantively, like academically, argue for a certain theological position, right? But by doing so, they actually cause more confusion, more animosity, and ultimately more division, right? So if they keep doing that, we have to question, why are you doing this? Is it for nafs, or is it for haq, right? One of my teachers said, don't be a cause of fitna. The Prophet wasallam, he said, man samata najah, the one who is silent is saved. Right? A man came to Imam Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Muhammad, and the man said to him, who was right, Aisha or Ali? Pick a side. Right? And this, is, was, this was his response. Imam Ahmad, he said, Allah saved our swords from blood and picking sides. Why don't we now save our tongues from picking sides? In other words, I was not forced back then to pick a side. Thank God. He wasn't even alive back then. So why are you forcing me now to pick a side? Right? There was also a conflict between Ali and Muawiyah. Right? And you know, Sunnis by consensus agree that Sayyidina Ali was one of the most virtuous and holiest and greatest of the Sahaba. He's also Ahlul Bayt. Ali minni wa ana min Ali. Same kind of hadith about Imam al-Hussein. Man kuntu mawla, hada Ali mawla. 
If I am near and dear to you, this Ali is near and dear to you. The Prophet sallallahu said about Ali, you hibbu Allah wa rasuluhu, you hibbu Allah wa rasuluhu, wa you hibbu Allah wa rasuluhu. That he loves Allah and his messenger and is beloved to Allah and his messenger. Right? So the actions and decisions of Sayyidina Ali were better and wiser. Sayyidina Ali wanted to end the cycle of violence. Right? So by consensus, Muawiyah was wrong. You know, he's not from the rightly guided caliphs. But that does not mean we should curse and insult Muawiyah. Right? If Muawiyah was such a terrible man or a tyrant, Okay, certainly his son was a tyrant, but that's his son. And in our religion, the son doesn't inherit the sins of his father. That's a Christian belief. We don't believe that at all. Right? So if he was such a tyrant, why did Sayyidina Hassan make peace with Muawiyah? He made a truce with a tyrant? Imam Hassan abdicated the Khilafah over to a tyrant? This doesn't make sense. Right? The Prophet said, Inna ibn hada Sayyidun, about Imam Hassan. Indeed, this son of mine is a master. SubhanAllah. This, this son of mine, his grandson, Imam Hassan, is talking to him in the hadith. But he calls him my son. This son of mine is a master. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make peace through him will bring two groups together through him. Not just any groups. Mean and Muslimin are the two great groups of Muslims. Muslim believers. He'll give them peace. You see. So so Jidal is with Ahlid Kitab. Okay. The ulama among each other engaged in something called Munavara. Disputation. This is when two sides already agree upon some sort of underlying premise or universal, and then they try to mutually uh, arrive at the truth about some particular issue. So, for example, they agree that the Prophet ﷺ is a true prophet, but what were the particular ways in which he received the wahi? They'd have a dispute. Okay? Um, but jidal is when your goal is to convince your opponent that he is wrong and you are right about a fundamental issue. Like when we convince Jews and Christians that Muhammad is Rasulullah. So jidal debate is with Ahl Kitab. And it has certain etiquettes that are associated with it. Right? Udu'u ila sabili rabbik bil hikmati wal mu'idati al hasana wa jadilhum bil lati hiya ahsan. Like call people to the way of your Lord with academic sophistication, with good comport, good etiquette, good adab. Right? And, and we're not supposed to waste our time on mustahzi'un. There are a lot of people on the internet. Right? A lot of Christian apologists, a lot of Muslim apostates, you know, that, that want to debate, like Muslim ulama, and, and they're saying, I'm not going to give you a platform. You are a mustahzi. These are people who mock and insult their religion. So we're not supposed to engage with them. We don't give them a platform. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kafaynaka al mustahzi'in. He's saying to the Prophet sallallahu I am sufficient for the mockers. Let me take care of the mockers. You don't have to deal with them. Okay, so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commands us to speak to Ahl al-Kitab with such etiquette, then uh, how do you think we should speak to each other, Muslim to Muslim? So there, there's an athar, which is like a, a you know a, an ancient report. It's not a hadith, but it's from the Salaf. It's from the, the early uh, Muslims that says breaking the heart of a fellow Muslim is worse than destroying the Kaaba brick by brick. Okay, so this is meant to convey the gravity of such a thing, right? There's a hadith on Tabarani, the Prophet sallallahu he said, al-Muslim. That the most beloved action to Allah after the uh, fara'id is uh, to put joy in the hearts of other Muslims. Okay, and of course, we have this beautiful ayah in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, verse 103. وَاَتَسِمُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاَتَسِمُوا بِحَبِلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا That's 3.103 of the Qur'an. So hold tightly, all of you, to the rope of God and do not be divided. And what is the rope of God? حَبُّ اللَّهِ كِتَابُ The book of God, the Qur'an. Okay? وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا means do not join a firqa, 
A firqa is an exclusivist sect. There's a difference between a madhab and a firqa. You're encouraged to join a madhab. A madhab is just a school of thought, right? The difference is a madhab recognizes that there's truth in other madhab. They're not exclusivist, right? Whereas a firqa believes that they have the exclusive truth and everyone else is a kafir. You can't join a firqa. Like the khawarij was a firqa. We have the truth, and if you don't believe exactly as I do, you're a kafir. We don't care who you are. We don't care if your name is Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said, if you don't believe what we believe, you're a kafir. Right? So the rope of Allah is the Quran. So the Sunnis and the Shiites, they recite and memorize the same Quran. It's the same Quran. Okay? Despite our long standing differences, we stand united behind a single text. There are some rogue Shiites who said that. We say things like there's tahrif in the Quran and things like that. That's very much a fringe element amongst the amongst the Shia. Right? That's, that's kufr to even believe, even entertain that. Contradicts the Quran clearly. Okay, and, and you know the Christians can't say that. They, they can't they can't say that they're united on a book. Roman Catholics and Protestants they have a different version of the Bible. The Catholic version of the Bible is seven books longer than the Protestant version. I remember that. I used to do, you know, when I was an undergraduate, we had this dawah table, and, and the Christians would come and debate. Uh, you know, I was younger back then, so I had more energy. But this Christian guy came, and he was, and he was saying, why are there so many versions of the Quran? I said, well, what version of the Quran? I said, there's translations of the Quran. And then I figured out he's talking about the Qara'at of the Quran. So I said, no, these are, not ver these are multiple readings of the same verses. They're not readings of different verses. It's the same verses. I said, well, I don't understand. I said, you know, the, the Prophet says, Salam, you would recite these verses in different ways. They convey different meanings that enrich the meanings of the Quran. Said, oh, yeah. So I, I said to him, I said, because um, he was holding a Bible, and I usually bring all my Bibles, and I said to him, can you, can you read First Maccabees for me in your Bible? And he said, yeah, and, he, and he's, you know, Christ, he, was a, he was a Protestant Christian, so he pulled out this King James Version of the Bible, and he's flipping through it, and he said, what's the name of the book? And, he, and I said, First Maccabees. And he's flipping through it, and he said, Malachi? You know, first Maccabees. Okay, he's looking through it. I don't see it in here. I said, look on the table of contents. He's looking at it. It's not there. It's oh, but I have it here in my Roman Catholic version, a different version, right? Completely different. Seven extra books. Okay, so we have where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala united us upon a single text, a primary text. And then Allah says, What kuru ni'matullahi alaykum if kuntum aada and fa Allah fa bayna kurubikum fa asbahtum bi ni'matihi ikwana, wa kuntum ala shafa hufratim mina nari fa ankabakum minha. Kadarika yubin Allah lakum ayatihi la alakum tahdadun. So he says, Remember the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you when you were enemies and Allah brought your hearts together and you became brethren by means of his blessing, and you were on the brink of falling into the fire when he saved you from it. Um uh, like so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes clear for you his signs in order for you to be guided. So according to the exegetes, <clears throat> uh, the ni'mah mentioned in this ayah that brought people together in the first instance to oust in the Khazraj was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Okay, so we can come together on this principle of love of Ahl al-Bayt. The Quran says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّدَ فِي الْقُرْبَةِ This is chapter 42, verse 23. Say, no reward do I ask of you for this except the love of the qurba, like family. Okay? So Imam Qurtubi, Imam Tabari, Ibn Ajiba, and many others, they say they say that al qurba here is Ahlid Bayt Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That we are commanded in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love the family of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, Imam Shafi'i, he said, Ya Ahlid Bayt Rasulullah, Hubbukum Faradun min Allahi fi al-Fitab. Oh, people of the house, of the prophetic house, uh, your love is obligatory in the book of God. Man lam yusalli alaykum la salat salah. Whoever does not send benedictions upon you in the prayer, there's no prayer for him. The, the, uh, the salah ala nabi wa ala alihi is a rukun of the prayer in the shafi'i matha. If you forget to do that, your prayer is bothered. If you do your prayer over again, your prayer is not valid. But here's a question. How can you command someone to love someone else? Right? So if I said to you, I command you to love my cousin, right? how could you? 
You couldn't. You don't know my cousin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is essentially, it's implicit, he's essentially commanding us to know, to learn about the family of the Prophet sallallahu And by knowing his family, uh, his virtues and piety and struggle, then we will naturally and genuinely come uh, to love his family sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakallah khairan. I'll stop at this point. Are there any questions here we can take? Maybe a couple if there's time. That was one online. Okay. Ah. Ah. So this question is I'm a new Muslim. My question is why don't we commemorate the martyrdom of, of Hussein alayhi salam? As Sunnis, shouldn't we be concerned that within 50 years of the Prophet Sallallahu death, his grandson was murdered? It seems like we should commemorate his martyrdom too. Yes, we should. I, I agree. We should commemorate his martyrdom. We should remember him. Um, we should constantly be praising the Ahl al-Bayt. And of course, Imam al-Hussein is, as the questioner said, a grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Not only that, he's a, he's a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu So a lot of the times I think uh, people get caught up in emotion, they get caught up in, again, this kind of divisive rhetoric. So there are people who, I mean, I've, I've, quoted, I've quoted hadith in our books during a khutbah, praising Ahl al-Bayt, and people will come up to me and say, are you a, are you a Shi'i? And they don't know I'm from Iran, because if they, if that would be, a, I mean, if they knew I was an Iranian named Ali, they would assume you're, but they don't know anything about me, right? <laughs> so are you, so why do you think I'm a Shi'i? You, you said this about Imam Hussein. I said, this hadith is in Tirmidhi, this hadith is in Bukhari. This hadith, what are you talking about? Oh, I've never heard this hadith. You know, that's, that's a shame. You know, So I think people, for the sake of not being labeled a certain thing, are not being true to their tradition. You know, and that's, that's unfortunate. You know, um, but that we should, we should definitely, you know, when you say commemorate his martyrdom, you know, there, there are certain practices that our Shia brethren do to commemorate the, the martyrdom that are not acceptable according to the Sunni or the uh, Okay, so there's different ways, as, as I said in my lecture, there's different ways in which we commemorate Ahl al-Bayt. There's different ways in, in which different Sunnis uh, commemorate the Mawlid of the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone believes in the Mawlid of the Prophet. Mawlid means he was born. Right? Everyone believes, you have to believe that. And everyone has to show joy. They have to have joy in their hearts that the Prophet was born. You have to. But it doesn't mean you have to go to a gathering and listen to poetry about the Prophet. You can if you want. You don't have to. Right? Um, so we commemorate Imam al Hussein in different ways. You know, the, the, the deen is, is vast. Yes, sir. So, I can, uh, so just a quick question about um, the, some of the uh, associations with the, the, the day of Ashura that um, preceded the Prophet. I, I've heard stories about um, the Ark of uh, Sayyidina Nuh um, uh -huh. finding its final resting place and other, other sort of traditions. Just curious if there is validity to those and, and if you could share some of those if, if there are. Yeah, I mean, our ulama, they mention certain things. It's kind of a mystery. There isn't anything strong, um, anything reliable, anything really authentic um, uh, in, our, in our tradition. But some of the ulama mentioned things. There was definitely something there, okay, uh, because there, there are, according to some of the ulama, the Prophet ﷺ was also fasting Yumi Ashura. Uh, before he entered Medina, so that means that there's there's definitely validity in his fast. It was something that was connected to, according to the tradition, to Ismail alayhi salam in some way, and other prophets as well. Now, some of the ulama sort of uh, conjecture what that could have been, whether the the Ark of Noah do docked at Jabal Judi on Yomi Ashura, or they, they mention things like the the Torah descended upon. Uh, Musa alayhi salam, or some of them say during Ramadan or the Injil Kinder Isa alayhi salam, or he was ascended into heaven. 
Allahu a'lam. We don't know exactly what it was. Okay, but there's some significance because it was a practice of the Prophet and Everything he does is guided, even before his nabuwa. Okay, He's, he, he has isma his whole life. This is our aqidah. And this is why there's irhas, there's pre-prophetic miracles attributed to him. When he was a boy, he went to Bostra and there was a cloud following him. Okay, and there was trees that were shading him. Uh, this means that he is the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even during then, but he's not sent as a prophet yet. So he has isma, and he has a clean reputation. This is an argument for his nubuwa, right? No one could say anything to him when, the, when he became a prophet, when he began to preach the Qur'an. None of the mushrikeen could say, oh, weren't you the guy who did X, Y, and Z when you were a teenager? Nobody could say anything like that to him, right? Uh, that's why in the Qur'an, the Qur'an makes his argument. It says, you know, it says, a whole lifetime I have been among you, right? A whole lifetime I've lived among you. In other words, look at my reputation. Do I make things up? Am I, do I lie? Do I want power? You know, uh, am I a violent person? None of that. A sadiq al amin, that's what they called him. That's their own title. It's what the mushrikeen gave to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa A sadiq al amin, right? So a lot of these, these hadiths, a lot of these traditions are weak. There's nothing really solid. But there is something there. We just don't know exactly what it is. All right. No questions from the ladies? Sakala khairan. Thank you for coming. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.